Good morning, welcome to CMC Markets on Friday the 15th of July and this quick look at the week ahead with me, Michael Hewson. Um, it's looking pretty much set up for another negative week or a negative week for equity markets. Um, this week we've seen a significant amount of volatility yet again and most of this week's Price action has been dominated by rising recession risk, um, global slowdown against a backdrop of rising inflation and the potential for more aggressive central bank action when it comes to containing said inflation. So what does that mean for equity markets going forward? Well, certainly this week's this week's events have been dominated by events in China. We started the week off by concerns that Q3 GDP growth in China was likely to be held back, shall we say, by a continued stop-start nature of COVID-induced restrictions or lockdowns. We found out that the various lockdowns during Q2 um, prompted the Chinese economy to contract by 2.6% on a quarterly basis, which meant that on an annualized basis, the Chinese economy only grew 0.4% in the second quarter. So that essentially means that it's highly unlikely that the Chinese economy will get anywhere close to its 5.5% GDP target for this year. Even though we did see a modest improvement in retail sales in June, that's largely as a consequence of the big decline, as a, as a bounce back from the big declines that we saw in April and May. Looking forward, um, this week has been dominated by some really big jumps in not only US CPI, which rose to 9.1%, but also in retail, in producer prices, U US PPI prices, which also jumped sharply in June, largely driven by big spikes in food and energy prices. What was noteworthy though, and, it, and this did seem to get lost, I think a little bit in the fog of a surging dollar, was the fact that core prices in both cases actually fell back in June, even as the headline number pushed higher. Nonetheless, we saw the dollar index move to its highest levels in nearly 20 years. The euro dollar move below parity um, for the first time since 2002, with the prospect that we're likely to see further euro declines over the course of the next few weeks. As we look ahead to this week's, this coming week's European Central Bank rate decision. We also saw this week a monster hike from the Bank of Canada. I, I had expected the Bank of Canada to move by 75 basis points this week. Um, I think when officials at the Bank of Canada looked at the US CPI numbers, I think there was perhaps a concern that maybe the Fed might be more aggressive when it comes to hiking rates on the 27th of July, and consequently the Bank of Canada raised rates by 100 basis points. Of course, the CPI numbers that we saw out this week from the Federal Reserve prompted similar concerns that we may, fees, we may see the Federal Reserve go by 100 basis points when they meet um, later this month. Now, that expectation, even though the market started to price it in, has been tempered somewhat by comments from Federal Reserve Board Governor Christopher Waller, who said that he thought the market was getting ahead of itself by pricing in 100 basis points. This was the very same policymaker who only a few weeks ago said the Fed was all in on inflation. So he softened his tone a little bit. But on the other hand, we've got Raphael Bostic of the Atlanta Fed, who said that everything is in play for July the 27th. So ultimately, 100 basis points is in play. Nonetheless, St. Louis Fed President James Bullard said that he wasn't in favour of a 100 basis points move at this time, um, which helped pull European equity markets and US equity markets off their lows for the week. So that's essentially where we are at this point in time. We're still 
down on the week. US bank earnings season is well underway. And certainly I think in terms of earnings expectations, the rubber is starting to hit the road when it comes to the potential for further earnings downgrades as we look ahead to Goldman Sachs and Netflix and Tesla in the coming week. So as we look ahead to next week, let's have a quick look at the various key chart points on the various indices. And as we can see from here, not really any change to the range um, trading that we're seeing on the FTSE 100. Fairly decent support in and around this 7,000 level. We've tested it quite a few times this month without breaking through. Once again, we've rebounded off it. We've rebounded off it back here. And really, I think for pretty much all of this year, 7,000 has been a pretty solid, solid support, aside from a bit of a tick lower in the aftermath of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. It's also been notable this week as markets increasingly price the prospect of a recession has been the big declines that we've seen in commodity prices, notably copper and crude oil. And what we're also got to be aware of um, as we look ahead to um, the, cent the ECB raising rates next week, because that is what is expected, albeit by a fairly modest 25 basis points, is what effect an economic slowdown will have on events in Europe. Because the weakness of the euro is coming a real problem for the ECB. There's a number of factors at play, obviously. The shutdown of Nord Stream 1 for maintenance for 10 days. Um, that's due to roll off around about, that's due to restart on the 21st of July. And there is perhaps a concern that um, Russia might use um, any means necessary to perhaps delay the reopening of Nord Stream 1. That's certainly been, that's certainly not been reflected um, in the way oil prices have behaved this week or commodity prices in general. We've seen a big decline in commodity prices this week and copper this week hit a 20 month low. So. Um, Recession risks are rising at the same time as central banks are having to consider much tighter monetary policy going forward. Now, in historical terms, interest rates are still very, very low, particularly when you consider where inflation levels are right now. The last time inflation levels um, were at this sort of level, interest rates were well above the headline inflation rate. So when we look ahead to UK inflation later um, later in this week, we're expecting that to come in around about 9.2, 9.3%. And the last time inflation was at this sort of level, interest rates were above 10%, base rates were above 10% in the UK economy. So there's a significant mismatch in terms of where rates are relative to where headline inflation is. So still keeping a fairly decent eye on support down here on the upside, still looking to sell rallies on equity markets. The DAX is looking particularly vulnerable at this point in time. We can see that here. Fairly solid support at 12,400, still holding. But we need to bear in mind that each subsequent rally off 12,400 has become shallower, particularly the one that we saw on the 5th of July, only got as far as 13,000. And now we're back there again. And yes, we have bounced off there this week and we are rebounding, but we really now need to have, we need to have evidence that that base is in with a break above 13,000 and a move back towards the 50 day moving average to gain some form of confidence that perhaps we could start to see a modest rebound. Similar story on the S&P 500, still very much in a downtrend, pulled off the lows of the day um, yesterday by those comments from Christopher Waller and James Bullard, where they rather played down expectations of a 100 basis point rate hike in July. Doesn't mean the Fed won't do it, but I think that could well be 
that could well be determined by how strong US retail sales are later today. Um, these are due out later this afternoon, just in the aftermath of me recording this video. So if we get a strong number for US retail sales, that could give Fed policymakers more confidence to be more aggressive when it comes to rate rises. And personally, I think 75 basis points is still the, um, it's, I think it's still the uh, probably the most probable outcome, but certainly 100 basis points has suddenly, suddenly, suddenly started to become less of a tail risk than it was a week ago. And we do really need to be cognizant of that risk. Okay, so that's the S&P 500. There's the key resistance, 50 day moving average and the trend line resistance from there. Similar sort of story when it comes to the NASDAQ 100. We could probably draw a line through here. But for me, I think the big level on the NASDAQ still remains very much this peak here at around about 12,230, um, which we managed to stay below when we got last week's payrolls numbers hit the tape which to all intents and purposes was a still a fairly decent number going forward. And I think those payrolls numbers, the strong CPI numbers, do make the prospect of 100 basis points that much more probable than was the case a week ago. But given the fact that some of the, the two of the most hawkish FOMC members have played down expectations of 100 basis points and the Fed goes into blackout over the course of the next few days, I think they're going to want to avoid a situation that we saw in the lead up to the previous meeting where everyone was pretty much comfortable with the idea with 50. We got um, some fairly um, weak, we got some fairly weak numbers going coming into that meeting and the Fed suddenly started to brief. We got a hot CPI report and the Fed suddenly started to brief that um, they wanted to do 75 basis points while they were in blackout. I don't think they'll want to play that scenario out again. So I think by pairing back expectations of 100 basis points, Waller and Bullard are basically saying, look, 75 is fine on top of the 75 at the previous meeting. Let's just see where the data goes as we look towards Jackson Hole in August and obviously the next meeting in September. So looking looking at Euro dollar now because the main the main topic for this coming week is going to be not only um, the ECB rate decision, we're also going to be looking at um, UK CPI, the weakness of the pound against the dollar, and whether or not a strong CPI, UK CPI number, will increase the probability the Bank of England will do 50 basis points when they meet in early August. But let's start with the ECB. We're now, we've now broken below parity. We hit a low of 99.50. It keeps us very much on course now for my medium term target for Euro dollar of 96.20. If we look at the weekly chart and these projections that I laid out at the end of April for further weakness in Euro dollar, we've now hit my next target of parity. We now want to see a move that move extend lower towards 96.20 and a medium term target for this measured move that we projected all the way back in April or May. So what could be the catalyst for an even weaker euro? Well, there's certainly plenty of factors at play. There's a political instability in Italy. The ability of the ECB when they raise rates this week and whether it be 25 or 50 basis points to manage bond spreads between Italian and German bond yields. Now either the ECB need to do something. Inflation's already at a record 21.9% in Estonia. It's at 19.3% in Lithuania. The Baltic states are getting absolutely battered while countries like France are seeing 5.8%. And the only reason that French inflation is so low is because the French government has absorbed pretty much all of the fuel price increases by nationalizing EDF energy and forcing EDF not to price those increases on. 
So the, big, the ECB's biggest problem is not so much that it's powerless to mitigate current levels of inflation. It's that are they able to do it without causing further instability in Eurozone bond markets, particularly between Italian and German bond yields? There's growing pessimism that the ECB will be able to deliver on anything on bond buying that would keep it within the boundaries of what is legal, legal under the ECB capital key. Um, there's been talk of OMT, outright, outright monetary transactions. That was something that was laid out by Mario Draghi the last time this topic was discussed. But this is going to be a very, very difficult sell because it requires conditionality. And certainly German officials are very much of the opinion that if they go down the OMT route, then Italy has to abide by the conditionality um, for OMT. So Lagarde's got a really difficult tightrope to navigate. She's got to do more than tough, talk tough about an anti-fragmentation anti tool, because um, another fudge sandwich won't do the trick when it comes to convincing markets that the ECB has an answer to increasing political risk in Italy. Um, Draghi's potential resignation. Um, what sort of Italian government will we get over the course of the next few days and weeks? So, you know, we're we're navigating very tricky political waters going forward. So certainly I'm of the opinion that Euro dollar can continue to go lower. Sadly, I think cable will continue to suffer as well on the back of the stronger dollar. Hopefully by not as much, but certainly I think the UK unemployment data, the UK wages data and the CPI numbers um, will add a little bit to the Bank of England's thought processes when they meet in early August. Looking at CPI, that came in at 9.1% in May. Given the big jump that we saw in US CPI in June, you would expect to see something more than a forecast of 9.2% UK CPI for June. There is a distinct possibility that we could overshoot on that and move ever closer to 10%, maybe to around about 9.5. What we do know is that a lot of the increase in headline CPI is now starting to manifest itself not only in higher um, fuel prices, that's quite clear when you look at the prices at the pump, but also in food prices as well. When you get a situation where Tesco's is putting security tags on Lurpak butter, you know you're in the realms of significant food price inflation, and that's essentially where we are. So I think if we see a very strong CPI number this week, then the Bank of England needs to go and do something that it's never, ever done before. And that's raise interest rates in August by 50 basis points, 5.0, 5.0 basis points or more. Now the discussion is about getting inflation under control. And the GDP numbers that we saw out of the UK earlier this week are encouraging in that context, 0.5% um, expansion in May. Now, obviously, that is not likely to be sustained, but ultimately, I think it's really a question of what's the least worst option. And with the pound now even lower than it was a month ago, the Bank of England needs to get a grip of its mandate, which is to keep inflation on target at around about 2%, which means it needs to be more aggressive when it comes to raising rates and shake itself out of its current groupthink narrative. Wages looking again at fairly resilient numbers for the three months to May. We should start to hopefully see a move higher in the um, numbers excluding bonuses, which are set at 4.2. Including bonuses, they rose by 6.8% in April. That's likely to those are likely to be maintained in and around current levels, given that employers are under much more pressure now to pay 
their staff more. And obviously we've got rail strikes coming up uh, to endure rail strikes already. As more and more workers look for wage increases of more than 5%. Certainly, I think that's what we're starting to see. And we're starting to see average, raise, average wage increases coming in between 5 and 7% over the course of the next few months. And that in itself is likely to mean that the Bank of England will be forced to do more. So still remain on course for 115 in cable while we're below 120, 40, 50. Euro sterling um, trended lower, started to wedge back a little bit higher now as we head towards the ECB next week. Could see further strength towards around about 85, 30, 40. Um, but overall, we're still in the range that we've been in for the past few months. And I don't think that is likely to change going forward. So ECB, um, Euro Sterling, still very much a range trade. We've also got final EU CPI for June. And that the flash number there rose to 8.6%, up from 8.1% in May. That's likely to be maintained at 8.6%. We've also got, um, so and with the ECB meeting this week, I think it'll be particularly interesting as to whether or not, not only whether, of course, they, they raise rates by 25 basis points in the coming week, but what their guidance is for September. 25 is a done deal. Will they do 50? I would be surprised if they do, um, but never rule it out. But if they do do 50, then they've got to manage the fallout when it comes to bond yields. And uh, that could be a slightly trickier uh, conundrum to address. One thing I did forget to mention was UK retail sales for June. They're due at the end of the week. Could well see a little bit of a bank holiday bounce in them after the poor number that we saw in May. A decline of 0.5% there. Could see a little bit of a platinum jubilee rebound um, with, sales of, um, uh, with sales of food, giving the number a little bit of a positive kick higher. Um, as we come to the end of Q2. In terms of earnings numbers, there's going to be three that I'm going to pay particular attention to this week. Um, just quickly bring in the Tesla. Um, Tesla graph, there we go. Starting with Royal Mail. We've got Royal Mail coming out. Those shares are up, but they're at very, very low levels at the moment. Expectations around Royal Mail, pretty low, pretty low. It's their first quarter numbers. There are concerns about strike action. There's already been a work to rule on the part of managers, um, and that's currently starting today, between the 15th and the 22nd of July. And there'll be a complete strike on the 20th to 22nd of July. So this action will serve to cause further disruption to Royal Mail activities. And you can certainly see in, in this chart here that there is potential for further declines. Nonetheless, Royal Mail management still feel fairly confident that they can generate a combined operating profit of 623 million for the new fiscal year. So I think it will be interesting to see whether or not they maintain that guidance given the current backdrop, obviously higher costs when it comes to energy prices, but also higher costs when it comes to potential salaries and um, potential redundancies. We've also got uh, Goldman Sachs continuing the UK bank earnings theme. Big, big level, I think, for Goldman Sachs here, around about 273, coincides with these, these, these lows here and those previous peaks there. So that's a bit of a level there for Goldman Sachs. JP Morgan this week. Um, disappointed, as did Morgan Stanley. We've got Citigroup later today. They're likely to potentially um, paint a similar picture. And what was notable was that JP Morgan actually stopped their buyback program as a result of concerns about increasing loan loss, provi loan loss provisions against a backdrop of rising inflation. So. Goldman Sachs doesn't have a big retail operation, but certainly I think some of the M&A revenues, investment bank revenues that we saw, big declines there on the back of investment banks, that could also be a theme for Goldman Sachs 
when they release their numbers on Monday. Netflix. Netflix, I don't think it's too fine a point to say Netflix is in big trouble when it comes to what's going to be expected for this week's numbers. Certainly, if you look, at, look back at where it was in November, the implosion in the share price has been quite something. And you can really see where the various profit warnings, the earnings numbers came out. So the big question here, I think, is what would constitute an upside surprise? Have we hit peak Netflix? Obviously, I think the emergence of companies like Disney Plus, or Disney, with, with their Disney Plus offering, Amazon, Paramount Plus now is come to the fore, is making things an awful lot more difficult. And I think when you look at the amount of money that's being spent, Amazon spending on a new Lord of the Rings series called Ring of Power, Paramount Plus, um, it's, it's also got a strong catalogue with a new Star Trek series, Strange New Worlds, as well as a new season of Star Trek, a new season of Star Trek Discovery, which used to be on Netflix, and now season four is no longer on Netflix, and neither are seasons one to three, they're now on Paramount Plus. So even though Netflix brought forward the latest season of Stranger Things, I think a big win for Netflix would be if they didn't lose subscribers in Q2. They're certainly expecting to. They lost 200,000 customers in Q1 against an expectation they would gain two and a half million. Netflix has said it expects to lose another two million subscribers in Q2, um, downgrading that from an expectation of plus 2.4 million. So hopefully it's lowered the bar low enough that they are actually able, they are actually able to beat expectations. For revenues, Netflix has said it expects to grow its revenues by about 10% year over year and can have an operating margin of 19 to 20%. Given current trends when it comes to inflation, this does appear optimistic. And the stronger dollar isn't helping. The dollar is now even stronger than it was when we had a profit warning here and we had a profit warning here. Now, Netflix is producing films and TV in more than 50 countries. Three out of its six most popular TV seasons using non-English language titles, yet it refuses to hedge its US, expo US you know, its FX exposure. Why would you not do that when you could potentially make a billion dollars more in revenue by doing such a thing? It makes no sense. There's talk about a lower cost advertising model. It's teamed up with Microsoft to deliver that. The big risk with that, it risks cannibalizing its higher value subscription model. So Netflix, big test as we look ahead to the upcoming week. Can it start to mitigate some of the losses and prompt a, re and prompt a rebound back above $200? We'll soon find out on the 19th of July. Tesla. Okay, let's get shot of that. That appears to have found a base just above $600. The biggest concern that I have about Tesla is, is Elon Musk's mind in the game when it comes to Tesla? Because most of the narrative around Elon Musk over the past quarter has been over the Twitter acquisition, which now looks like it's not going to happen. So Tesla's been trading sideways pretty much for the past four or five weeks. The disruption in China has certainly impacted and will have impacted the number of cars that it has been able to deliver over the past quarter. If we look at the maintenance shutdowns, we've also seen in Berlin, as well as obviously Shanghai. Um, those, those maintenance shutdown, shutdowns have also coincided with COVID shutdowns. So 
having delivered a total of 936,000 vehicles in 2021, there were high hopes that Tesla would be able to get above the 1 million deliveries level in this current fiscal year. Now, both Q1 and Q2 deliveries have been disrupted due to supply chain disruptions, which means that it could struggle to hit that target. In Q1, Tesco, Tes, Tesco's, Tesla, in Q1, Tesla was able to deliver around about 310,000 new vehicles. In Q2, that's fallen back to 254,000. Uh, and obviously in China, April um, output was 1,512 with zero exports. And in June, Tesla managed to deliver 78,906. So in April, production virtually ground to a halt in China. So that will obviously affected its Q2 numbers. So I think in terms of how it's looking for Q3 and Q4, if they were able to get production back up to over 300,000 a quarter, then obviously 1 million remains very much in the ballpark. Expectations are for profits to come in at a dollar. 81 cents a share. But obviously, I think the big key support level on Tesla is anywhere around these sorts of levels here, $620. So I'm keeping an eye on that when Tesla comes to release its numbers later this week. If we look at, um, quickly look at Brent crude, just as we're tidying things up, some fairly decent support in and around the 200 day moving average. We've seen a big sell off. If we break the 200 day moving average, then we could well see further declines in Brent crude. Now, obviously, if we do see further declines in Brent crude, that will be because the market perceives that we're going to see a very significant slowdown going forward. Nowhere is that better illustrated in this copper chart, where we're starting to see inflationary pressures in commodity prices more broadly start to diminish quite sharply. 20 month low for copper prices. So keep an eye on base metals, keep an eye on precious metals. More importantly, keep an eye on agricultural commodities because we've also seen steep falls in the price of corn and wheat and oats. And that is playing out in the CMC Markets Commodities Index, which has seen some fairly decent falls since the peaks back in May and June. And again, that is likely to have a dilutive effect when it comes to inflation repressures. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, that is very much it for me, from me for this week. Once again, thank you very much for listening. Hope you all have a great weekend and are able to cope with the upcoming heat wave on Monday and Tuesday. Until the same time, same place next week. Thank you very much for listening. It's Michael Hewson talking to you from CMC Markets.